Uh, I'm Chris Evans, so I'm the president here of the Southern Chapter of the Native Plant Society, and I'm super excited about today's presentation on Oaks and Caterpillars by Jim Whitfield. Um, I think we're going to learn a whole lot here, everybody. So instead of um, belaboring it, I think I'm just going to turn it straight over to our presenter and let him take it from here. All right. Thanks. Uh... Yeah, I'm Jim Whitfield. I'm a professor at the University of Illinois. Um, I teach the insect classification and evolution uh, up there and students make collections and that sort of thing. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about sort of what I do research wise and, um, and uh, some things that are kind of related to this topic, but not exactly on the topic. Um, this uh, this talk was uh, sort of, uh, I guess, originated because, uh, and I was invited to give the talk uh, through uh, Nancy Garwood, who um, had seen this book uh, that a group of us produced in um, 2019, uh, and I'll be giving you some information from this book as I go along. Um, it's, it came out from the US Forest Service in 2019, and it actually was a book that was about 25 years in the making. Um, uh, it probably shouldn't have been 25 years, but it was, and it ended up being better because we had all that time. But um, so this uh, book was the product of a lot of years of research, not a, not really all intended to produce this book. Um, but I will tell you a little bit more about the caterpillars and the oaks that are in this book. Um, and uh, a little bit about the natural history of these animals and plants. Uh, so that if once we start getting out from under the snow, you might actually be able to see some of the the organisms I'm talking about today um, maybe give you a little better eye for what you're looking for. So I also do a little, as I mentioned, a little bit of work in uh, insect classification and evolution. And I have another book that's actually coming out uh, late this month or early next month that gets used as a textbook in that area. So, um, you might see that book around if you ever go to an entomology class, but otherwise it's not, you know, one of the great bestsellers of, of science. Um, so what I work on are some very tiny organisms. Um, if you uh, look over to the right of this pen, um, there's a, a small wasp that's running around on my desk, the desk I'm sitting at right now. And that gives you an idea what size they are. Um, and these little wasps are parasites of caterpillars. So that's how it relates to this talk. Um, and those little wasps uh, are in a subfamily of wasps that have about 40,000 species in them. And they all kind of look like that little wasp that you see there. So as you can imagine, they're kind of difficult to work on taxonomically and, and to have any real way of separating them, uh, particularly in the field. Um, so here's one of these wasps at the bottom over ovipositing or laying its eggs inside a hawk moth caterpillar, uh, that sort of bluish green thing at the bottom. Um, and it lays its eggs inside the caterpillar and those eggs hatch and it's a small larvae that live as the caterpillar continues to grow. They live inside the caterpillar and eventually tunnel their way at, back out of the caterpillar to, to pupate and then become adults again. And in that whole process, the caterpillar dies or 99.9% .9 of the time the caterpillar dies. So they end up killing the caterpillar, but in the process, they produce a new generation of wasps. Uh, so this is uh, sort of my uh, specialty is these wasps that attack caterpillars. Um, 
Let's see. So these caterpillar parasites sort of fall into two groups. One of them on the right side of this diagram called idiobiont ectoparasitoids. That's just a, a way of saying it's a, parasi a parasite that uh, doesn't allow its host to develop. So it lays eggs inside a host, caterpillar, um, or lays eggs on the surface a lot of the time. And it injects a venom into the caterpillar, which paralyzes the caterpillar. And then the eggs hatch and the larvae either feed on the outside of the caterpillar or feed on the inside of the caterpillar. And they emerge and that's uh, sort of the end of the caterpillar and it's a new generation of wasps. So this particular kind of biology um, what later in some groups evolved into what we now see as stinging bees and ants and wasps. Uh, and in those cases, the stinger and the venom is not really used to lay eggs anymore. It's used to defend the nests that they have. And so they still have venom, but the venom is now uh, intended to, to create pain in us rather than to paralyze a caterpillar. So that's sort of one endpoint of uh, the evolution of these little wasps. Another one is the group that I work on is one where they haven't actually uh, abandoned the habit of being parasites of caterpillars, but they've made the whole interaction much more complex so that they not only inject venom into a host, but they have a symbiotic virus that they inject which interacts with the immune system of the caterpillar so that the caterpillar doesn't recognize the wasp larvae inside it as being foreign. They don't recognize them as being parasites at all. They just kind of get free reign. So it's a pretty crazy complicated system when you get the immune system involved. Um, so the ones that I work on are the ones on the left here. Um, and so part of what I do my research on is the complexity and evolution of that particular system. So just to give you an idea that kind of ties this together to how it relates to caterpillars on plants is um, this is sort of a series of life cycles. Um, the one in the center virus life cycle, which I won't bother you with right now, it's just the virus that the wasp carries. The wasps are in the kind of blue ring in the center. Um, that's a life cycle of the wasps. And I already described that. They lay their eggs inside the caterpillars and then eventually come out of the caterpillar, as you can see sort of in this upper right. And then they spin their cocoons and eventually the adult wasps come out of the cocoons and then start the cycle again. And then you have the caterpillars that are feeding on plants. Now this one in the illustration is the tomato hornworm that probably many of you have seen in gardens with all these little cocoons of the wasps on their backs. Very common garden insect. So this is sort of like the model organism for this kind of interaction. But there are many, many thousands of these uh, wasps out there and many thousands of caterpillars. So it's a, that's sort of the part of the system I work on. But in order to study this, I have to know something about plants and caterpillars in order to look very broadly at this. So one of the things that's happening really all over the world is sort of an effort to look at the host relationships. The caterpillars and which plants they feed on, their parasitic wasps and which caterpillars they feed on. And in some cases, for instance, in my system, um, little viruses that live within the wasps that attack the caterpillars that are on the plants. So it's, um, so this all starts with the plants, surveying the plants and then finding out what caterpillars feed on them and then rearing it those caterpillars to be adults or parasites or whatever. And there are projects going on like this all over the world. 
Um, and I interact with a lot of these projects. Today's talk will really focus a little more on our local North American uh, project uh, that's been going on for about 25 years in, um, in the Midwest here, um, particularly in Missouri. So what all of these projects have in common is that there are researchers, sometimes helpers and so forth, that go out into the field and just search plants and pick off leaves that have caterpillars on them and put them in bags and bring them back to some central place and separate the caterpillars out and the plants out and put them in containers, sometimes plastic bags as you see here, um, or sometimes jars, things like that. And then they're checked frequently and eventually you'll either get a butterfly or a moth from the caterpillar, or you'll get some of these parasitic wasps or parasitic flies, or occasionally fungi or nematodes or other things. But most of them are, have either adults or they have flies or wasps come out of them. So uh, in order to make one of these inventories work, you have to have people involved who can identify the plants, which in um, the neotropics is no mean feat. Um, and then you have to have people who can identify the butterflies and moths and the caterpillars, and then people who can identify the parasitic wasp and so forth. So I'm one of the wasp guys that is in this system. Um, so there are these various projects, as I mentioned, all over the world. I, two of them I'm very associated with are uh, going in Ecuador and Costa Rica, but there are many other ones, as I pointed out. But uh, the one I'll spend more time talking about today is, is more local. If you go to those tropical sites, you will see food webs. The little yellow dots here are represent 509 species of these wasps I work on. Little orange dots in the middle are 735 species of caterpillars. And at the bottom are the plants that they feed on, 647 species. So this is like the, a food web of all the relationships among them in one park in Costa Rica. So it gets really, really complicated. It's a lot simpler here in central US, but it still gets pretty complicated as I think I'll show you as we go along. In the Midwest here, we have uh, a pretty good diversity, particularly there where a lot of you are in the Southern Illinois and in the Ozarks. Um, there's pretty rich, um, at least for North America, pretty rich forest. And one of the main groups um, of plants or dominant groups of plants or oaks. Um, so the, that field guide that I showed you is basically the results of surveying the caterpillars on the oaks in the Ozarks. Um, and it has also given rise to a number of other research papers. I'll mention a couple of them as we go along. Um, but it's it's basically focusing on the oaks in our region. So again, this was one of the products of that, um, but it's, it's really something that evolved because when we were identifying all the caterpillars on the oaks, it turned out that they were so diverse and so poorly known that we couldn't even identify them ourselves to do the ecological work. So we ended up having to produce this book to even do the analyses. So it's kind of uh, what happens when you get in over your head, you 25 years later, you have a product. Um, so oaks uh, are really tremendously uh, rich tree group, at least in uh, temperate zones, uh, they're rough 500 species worldwide, and many of them have hybrids, so that's really difficult just using um, uh, anatomical characters to tell some of them apart in the zones where they hybridize. Uh, 
generally speaking, you can get pretty close, but there are places where they're really hard to identify. Um, there are about 90 species in the US. Um, they're rich, somewhat richer in Mexico. Um, and then they start to decrease in diversity as you go down into Central America and Northern South America. And in the tropics, they're mostly sort of upland trees. So in North America, there are about, there are currently recorded about 724 species of Lepidoptera or butterfly and moth larvae, caterpillars feeding on oaks. In Missouri, we recorded between 150 and 200 caterpillar species feeding on oaks. Um, there are likely to be at least double that in our area, but almost all the ones that add on to that 150 to 200 are going to be really rare things. So um, really the fauna realistically would be about 150 to 200 caterpillar species. But when you consider we're just talking about oaks and we're just talking about Missouri, that's a lot. Um, so that was the, the situation we were going into when we were doing field work on oaks. Um, so in our area, the oaks that we've uh, sampled are the white oak, Quercus alba, Macrocarpa, the, the bur oak, Stellata, the post oak, Muhlenbergii, Chicopin oak. Uh, we're leaving out a few here that were actually relatively uncommon in the areas that we sampled. Um, and then there's the red oak group, the ones with the sort of spiny tipped leaves. Um, and these two different groups of oaks, the red oak group and the white oak group, actually get a slightly different complex of caterpillars on them. So you might not notice much difference between the different species in the red oak group as to which caterpillars they get, but they'll tend to get different ones from the white oak group, which you know, makes some sense if you understand the, the chemistry and morphology of the oak leaves and so on. So here are a number of red oak group oaks that we sampled, um, including red oak, very common thing. Um, the black oak, also very common. And the others we sampled at lesser numbers, but were also found in the area. And again, there are other ones that are not um, absent from the Ozarks, but they're just not present in a, enough numbers for us to have really sampled them much or not enough to be useful anyway. Now, you'll notice there's, for those of you who know oaks, there's also a live oak group, which in the areas we were sampling was pretty much absent. But going across North America, there's a very rich fauna of caterpillars also on live oaks, um, particularly when you get to the west coast and to the Gulf Coast. So uh, from now towards till the end of the talk, I'll show you a number of different sort of types of caterpillars, sort of ecological types, and then sort of a few portraits of maybe um, recognizable caterpillars that are in our fauna. Um, so these different types, I'm gonna go through um, individually with some examples, but I did want to sort of show them all on one slide. So you get a little bit of an idea of the diversity of situations where you find caterpillars where they're not always really obvious when you first look at the leaves. Um, see a caterpillar up at the upper right here in a sheet under a sheet web, but when those webs get really dense and they just look like a white sheet. You know, you can't tell whether it's a caterpillar or a spider or, or whatever is underneath it. Um, and these are meant for protection for the caterpillar. Um, there are also ways that caterpillars have of folding leaves over and then hiding within them. There are others that mine within between the layers of a leaf so that they're actually not exposed to the outside. Um, some of the caterpillars will web leaves together and then feed between the layers of leaves that are stuck together by the silk uh, 
Uh, there are others that will basically eat all of the leaf tissue except the veins. Uh, and they, this is called skeletonizing the leaves. And then usually the caterpillars hide along a leaf vein in a sort of a shelter so that they don't actually look most of the time like there's even a caterpillar there. Um, and then other ones roll up the edges of the leaves. And if you've looked hard on trees and shrubs and um, even herbaceous plants of various kinds, I, you've seen all these different kinds of things. It's just, sometimes it's not always obvious that they're caused by caterpillars. So to kind of go through each of these sort of types of feeding on leaves, there are leaf miners. And as I mentioned, what's happening here is the caterpillars are actually slicing between the top layer and the bottom layer of a leaf and feeding on the tissue in between. So many of these caterpillars are highly flattened and basically slice their way between the layers of the leaf. Uh, and as a result, they leave behind a sort of a track. So if you know what to look for, you can often tell which caterpillars they are before even seeing the caterpillar because they leave behind a kind of characteristic shape of mine in the leaf. Um, and some of these have particular habits of making a little layer that folds over on the leaf edge, as you can see at the upper right here. Some of them make these big um, sort of open uh, blister looking things um, on the bottoms of leaves, as you see at the bottom. And some of them make these sort of more winding trumpet-like uh, mines and leaves. So these families here are all leaf mining moth families, uh, the Tichereidae, Nepticulidae, and Gracilariidae. And they're pretty diverse groups. I won't really have time to go through like a lot of the species of these things. But if you look at these things really up close, um, the upper right shows what a moth of a Philonorictor looks like. They're actually gorgeous little animals, but they're about an eighth of an inch long. Uh, so you don't really notice them too much. <laughs> you know, you might see them at your, at your porch light at night, but you probably wouldn't notice them much at that size. They, they're about the same size as a leaf hopper. Um, so here I've, I've made uh, a photo of some caterpillars at the left side of this slide, which you, where you can actually see the mine with the caterpillar in it. So you can see that it's between the layers of the leaf feeding along and they'll keep doing it until they're ready to emerge. And usually they dig their way out of the mine and make a cocoon or somewhere. But in the case of the blotch mines that you see on the bottom there, these are on the bottom of an oak leaf. Um, they often actually pupate inside the mine so that you actually never see a cocoon of the, of the caterpillar unless you go inside and peel one of those little blotches open and look for it. Um, so these are, are amazingly abundant, particularly in the late summer um, on a lot of different species of oaks. And there's uh, a pretty good diversity of these uh, caterpillars on oaks. So I won't really try to get into it because they're all um, relatively similar looking and highly diverse. Now the leaf tires, um, that was the example that I gave of the leaves that were sort of plastered on top of one another with silk. And then the caterpillars kind of etch away the surfaces of the leaves between the two layers of leaves. Um, there's several families that do this um, and multiple species. I mean, we're talking dozens of species that do this on oak, mainly in the Depressoriidae and the Galakiidae. Um, and so if you peel these leaves apart, you'll see these little damaged areas on the leaves. And as the caterpillars get older, they'll spin a lot of silk and they'll just look like they're in this really messy spot. And 
after they've spun enough of this and they've gotten enough caterpillar poop stuck all over it, it becomes really hard to tell if there's a caterpillar there or not. It's just, that's, that's a sign that they're getting ready to pupate and produce an adult. Another sort of form of hiding from predators um, and to some extent protecting them from the elements as well are producing sheets of silk on top of themselves. So here are some sheet webbers, a couple, a few different kinds from different families. Um, and in these cases, they don't necessarily protect them particularly well from birds, but they do protect them from things like ants. Uh, ants are particularly voracious predators of caterpillars. And uh, so some of the defenses that caterpillars have are designed for ants, and some of them are designed to hide from birds. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit later, that kind of defenses the caterpillars have. Um, and then leaf rollers, the ones that, as you can see at the right side of this slide, there are a couple of different leaf rolled leaves. And here are some caterpillars from the inside of those rolls. And you can tell they're pretty soft bodied and not very well armored. Uh, because they are protected from the outside by these uh, leaf rolls, they don't really invest much in protection against, they don't have any particularly spectacular coloration. Um, they don't have thick skins and so forth. So they, they consider themselves protected, but actually they don't, they're no, not able to avoid uh, parasitic wasps and sometimes birds particularly well. So they, they have pretty high mortality, even with this protection. Um, it is interesting though, that you've got these tiny little caterpillars on plants um, that can go and roll up leaves and web leaves together. And it just seems impossible for such a tiny caterpillar to exert the enough power to roll up a leaf. So what, it act, what they actually do is they spin a whole series of little silk strands um, from one side of a leaf to another. And they do this as a gradual process. And what, what happens is when they spin the silk, it's liquid and they attach it from one side of the leaf to another side of the leaf. And then as the silk dries, the silk is extremely strong and the silk dries, it contracts and it pulls the leaves together and they just keep doing this and let the silk do all the work to kind of pull the leaf into a roll. Um, and if you've ever tried opening up one of these things, you can tell that there's a certain degree of um, strength to the silk that webs these things together, even though the caterpillar would have no way of being able to move a leaf that big or manipulate a leaf in that way. So uh, these kinds of ways of manipulating have been referred to as ecosystem engineering caterpillars. And one of the interesting things about this is that by manipulating the leaves into all different kinds of shelters, the caterpillars not only find new ways to feed on the leaves, but they find different ways to protect themselves from both the elements and predators so that the diversity of caterpillars on the plants is increased several fold uh, over just feeding on the outside of the leaf, you know, and exposing oneself to predators. So uh, this was one of the papers that came out of the project that we were working on. It's, it was um, one of several different angles that come out of studying caterpillars on plants. Another one, um, just to kind of add another bit to this story of protection from predators, is one of the earliest papers that came out from the project was one that Bob Marquis, my collaborator at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and Chris Whelan from the Morton Arboretum did, uh, is that they designed various kinds of net to and cages to isolate plants, oak trees, and oak seedlings from birds. And 
so the the oak seedlings or oak uh, saplings and so forth were not experiencing any predation by the birds on the caterpillars. And they did a number of other sort of experimental manipulations into, of the system. But what they were able to find is that the caterpillars actually significantly decrease the growth and the reproduction of the oaks. Um, it's really difficult to show this kind of thing in most large systems like this. Um, because as you can imagine, sort of waiting to see how much reproduction an oak has is kind of a laborious process and a very long one. But they were able to at least look to see whether oaks that have caterpillars on them set more seed or produce more acorns and so forth than ones that do not have caterpillars on them. So the, the caterpillars are reducing the number of acorns that are produced and also reducing the size of the, the plant through reducing growth. So all the ones I've mentioned so far are ones that live inside shelters. And if you first look at the plant, you might not even see any caterpillars at all. But there are a huge diversity of external feeding caterpillars. So these are the ones that you would, if you just kind of started looking on leaves of oak trees, you would find them. Um, and some of them are quite conspicuous. Um, uh, they're referred to as aposematic, so that they've got very conspicuous, uh, sometimes uh, banded coloration, but at least very bright coloration. And almost all of those caterpillars would have some kind of toxin in them so that birds will know not to try to eat them. Uh, they'll recognize these caterpillars that are toxic and not feed on them. Um, this this particular strategy doesn't work particularly well against parasitic wasps, but it does protect against birds. Um, and the toxins are quite diverse in different kinds of caterpillars. There are cardiac glycosides, alkaloids, foranocoumarins, a lot of different compounds that are toxic to vertebrates, especially um, that um, protect the caterpillars from being eaten. They might not protect the first caterpillar that a bird tries to attack, but uh, after that, uh, they're avoided. The other strategy for caterpillars is to look cryptic. And most of these are not toxic. They don't really have any reason to um, build up or produce toxins. Um, so many of these are relatively uh, palatable to birds. Um, and pretty much any other animal that tries to eat them. Um, but they are hard to spot. So the one on the left here, this green caterpillar, um, from a distance looks remarkably like feeding damage on the plant and not like a caterpillar. And the one on the right here, um, looks just like a twig. If you, if you, kind of picking through leaves on a plant, you wouldn't really notice that being a caterpillar uh, initially. Some of them are just amazingly good at uh, reproducing the texture of twigs and so on. So, uh, so these, there's these two groups, the kind of more episomatic or protected ones, and then the ones that are not chemically protected, but are, uh, but are cryptic and hard to spot. Uh, these external feeders are taxonomically some of the most diverse groups of caterpillars that you run into on oaks. So just to go through a few of the more um, conspicuous caterpillars that you'll see, uh, this is a, a tiger moth larva. Um, there are a couple of different forms of this particular one. Some of them are yellow and some of them are black, but they're always bright colored. And these produce toxins that just make them um, toxic for birds to eat. They're very effective. This, en this entire subfamily of moths is uh, very good at sequestering chemicals from plants and producing them 
uh, and sometimes modifying them as toxins to protect themselves. Another strategy that happens in some of these happens among the, the slug caterpillars. Um, these slug caterpillars are called slug caterpillars because on the bottom side, they don't really have anything that looks very conspicuously like legs and they kind of glide along like a slug on plants. Um, they feed just like a normal caterpillar does. Um, but what happens in these is that they aren't poisonous to eat, but they sting. So this particular uh, slug caterpillar is very um, toxic if you touch these spines that are on the tubercles all over the uh, outside of the caterpillar. And they can be anything from just being annoyingly painful to being actually medically important in some cases with people that are very sensitive to the, to the venom in these things. And there's various different limacotids and uh, megalopigid caterpillars that do this. And some of them are quite bizarre looking. They, and at first glance, you wouldn't even think they're caterpillars. Like this one you could maybe recognize as a caterpillar, but that one, I mean, at first glance, you wouldn't necessarily even know what phylum of organisms it was. Um, so these are also protected. Actually, the sort of fur on the outside of this thing is not particularly toxic, but if you try to pick it up, underneath that fur is some um, sort of whitish spines and hairs that are quite toxic. And they can cause quite a burn on you if you hit, let one of these drop onto your arm or try to pick one up. So they're protected by stinging rather than toxic toxins that you can't eat. Another group of uh, caterpillars, the, the Lysenidae, the hair streaks and so on, protect themselves by producing uh, sugar water from their anus and the ants will actually come, um, the ants that are living on the tree will come and feed on the sugar water and the ants will protect the caterpillars from other ants or other insects that would otherwise feed on the caterpillars. So they've developed this relationship with ants. And in some trees, there will be nests of these chromatogaster ants on the tree at the same time the caterpillars are. And the ants will keep visiting the caterpillars and the, the caterpillars will receive protection from this nest of ants. So it's a very long standing relationship that uh, can be really complex in some cases. So at this point, I'll show you sort of a gallery of some caterpillars that we run into especially frequently. Um, many of the ones that we run into the most um, are ones that feed inside those leaf rolls and leaf ties and so on. And so you recognize them more by the roll than you do by the caterpillar. Um, but some of these uh, caterpillars you can you can learn to recognize over a period of time. But as I mentioned, there are 100 to 150 species of these and they can be um, really similar. Sometimes multiple species in the same genus that look more or less alike. So what I'm showing you here are just sort of some examples rather than you know an exhaustive guide to these caterpillars. Um, but here's one, it looks, uh, kind of impressive at this level, but it's really only about a quarter of an inch long. Um, and these are extremely common in like late spring on oaks. And you find these things on the bottoms of leaves of oaks. There's like hundreds and hundreds of them. So it, in general, if you go out and collect caterpillars from oaks, if you go out in the early spring, you'll find these leaf rollers and leaf tires and not a whole lot else. And then as it goes through late spring, you'll start to see more diversity, but smaller numbers of caterpillars. And then as the summer goes on, you'll 
start seeing more and more larger caterpillars on the plants, partly because it takes caterpillars a long time to grow, but also because oak leaves actually get harder as the season grows on and stiffer and harder to eat. So it takes a bigger caterpillar to eat mature oak leaves than the, the first early developing oak leaves. So you see like a change in the fauna over a season. So these are one of the ones that feed on the leaves while they're still kind of young. I showed you this picture earlier. This is a one of a group of caterpillars uh, that sometimes gets called loopers or spanworms. This particular one is called a spanworm uh, or inchworms. So it's the same group that the kind of inchworm kind of movements of caterpillars comes from. Uh, this particular kind of caterpillar, the spanworm, um, when it's not feeding, just becomes extremely rigid and in a position that looks like a twig. And it can just stay like that for hours. So these are incredibly difficult to spot on trees, even if they're common. Um, so these would be something that would be there in the mid to late summer. Um, this caterpillar uh, is fairly closely related to the tent caterpillars that um, are really common on a lot of small trees in spring. Um, and the tent caterpillar makes these really dense webs in the crotches of branches of trees and so on. This particular one doesn't make as much webbing as that, but they still tend to produce shelters that they go back and hide in. Um, and these caterpillars tend to be also gregarious. So when, you're, when you find one caterpillar, you find a whole bunch of them. So this kind of caterpillar will tend to like strip the leaves off a branch or two of an oak, but then not really affect the rest of the plant very much. They tend to kind of uh, overwhelm one particular part of the plant. Some of the nododonid caterpillars are just bizarre looking and uh, they've taken crypsis uh, not just to uh, a color, a sophisticated color um, direction, but also their shapes become almost impossible to recognize as caterpillars sometimes. And I, in some cases, they represent what looks like the edge, the dead edge of a leaf, and they just perfectly mimic the kind of damage that their own feeding does. So the, these can be incredibly common, but also very hard to spot. And this particular caterpillar gets up to over an inch long, and sometimes even then they're difficult to spot on leaves unless um, you look pretty closely. Uh, you might have noticed in some of these pictures that the leaves are taken from, the pictures are taken from the bottom of the leaf. So if you go out to an oak leaf, an oak forest, and start looking on the tops of oak leaves, you'll see almost nothing. And if you flip off all the leaves over and look on the bottom, that's where all the action is. Um, and that's the way we look for caterpillars, generally speaking, is to go and flip the leaves over and look at the bottom. It's like, it's so unlikely to find anything on the top, we don't even look a lot of the time. Another quite spectacular caterpillar is the, the imperial moth caterpillar. Uh, you can see the moth up in the upper right here. Uh, these caterpillars reach like a length of about four inches sometimes. Um, so they're spectacular animals, very fierce looking, and they, they can be really common sometimes, but we hardly ever see them. And that's because when they're feeding, they're almost always in the top branches of a tree. So you will not see them unless you get up to the top of the tree and you would have to take something like a bucket truck or something to, to get up there. Um, but late in the year, they crawl down to the, to the ground and walk around. And so most people that see these caterpillars see them when they're down on the ground, crawling off to try to find a place to pupate. 
So another huge caterpillar that you can find on oaks is the polyphemus moth caterpillar. Um, you can see the moth at the lower right. I'm, I'm pretty sure almost every one of you has seen one of these moths before. They're really big and they're, um, you find them particularly very late um, at lights and so on, porch lights. And um, if you, for some reason, one of the best places to see these things is uh, if you stop at rest stops along the highway, they have all these giant lights and stuff out there. It seems to be one of the best places to find them. So this is another caterpillar that tends to feed towards tops of trees. Can be really common, but you just don't see them until they're starting to look for a place to spend the winter. Another pretty large uh, caterpillar is this hawk moth caterpillar. And the, the moth is at the upper left here. Um, these are these are relatively common. The moths seem really common, but for some reason, when we go out and sample for these things, we run into them relatively rarely. I mean, the, it's often more common to see lots of caterpillars and very, relatively few of the moths, but this is one of the ones where the moths are not that hard to find, but the caterpillars are. So I don't know exactly what the reason is there. Um, but it's another case where I guess you could call this Crypsis. The green is trying to disguise itself against the leaf, I suppose. But um, they're big enough and conspicuous enough that you know I'm not sure that that works particularly well against birds. This is a larva of a skipper butterfly. Um, it's one of the skippers where there's a whole variety of different species that look pretty much alike. Um, but these caterpillars are unusual among the caterpillars that I've mentioned here um, in that these come out and start feeding on the leaves really early spring. And the one caterpillar just takes pretty much the entire summer and into the fall to mature. It's pretty, a very slow growing compared to most insects. And, um, I'm not really sure why, and they're not particularly well, apparently very well protected against parasite, parasitic wasps and things, but somehow they actually survive at a high level and, and reproduce, and um, they're very uh, abundant uh, when you first see the moths, fly, I mean the butterflies flying around there for a few weeks, they're extremely abundant. So I'm really, it's one of the mysteries to me is why these things survive so well when they take so long to grow and they don't seem to be protected by anything. So some of the ones here I have at the end are sort of relatively typical looking caterpillars uh, that you wouldn't necessarily notice very much uh, from a distance but up close, they're kind of beautiful animals. They have amazing patterns on them when you really get close to these things. Um, many of these belong to relatively diverse families. The Noctuity is one of the largest families of organisms really in the world. Um, another um, Noctuid here. Um, this particular one I uh, am very fond of because every different stage in its development, it's a different color. So it starts out yellow and then it goes orange, pink, and then it goes pink and orange. And it's there. We thought that we were sampling different species of cats and they all turned out to be the same thing, just different ages. Here's a relatively uh, less um, colorful caterpillar. But this is another one that's a bit of a mystery in that it feeds externally on leaves and it's not particularly well protected apparently. So, but it seems to survive very well. And I think what it does is during most of the day, it actually hides out on twigs where it is disguised. And then if you get there at 
at just the right time, it starts to feed. And that's the time when it would be susceptible to predators, but the rest of the time it's kind of hiding on twigs. Here's another one that's particularly small. It's not particularly cryptic, but for some reason it survives pretty well. Um, of course, in a lot of these things, we really don't have much idea how they protect themselves chemically. It's just a few species of caterpillars that have been studied in that respect. But this particular one is one of the most abundant caterpillars we run across, uh, particularly in late spring and early summer. So a lot of these caterpillars are, um, are recognizable here when I'm showing you these. But in some of these genera that I'm showing you, these particular species are one of a group that are particularly hard to separate from one another. So I've just showed you an example um, of, a of a species from a genus, but they look pretty different from one another here. But when you put the whole set of caterpillars together, it can be pretty difficult sometimes. So I won't... Uh, spend your entire evening showing you different species of caterpillars, but um, I've enjoyed showing you some of the ones that we did, we do see regularly. Uh, these are some of the other people responsible for doing the field guide that um, I showed you the, the cover of. Um, Bob Marquis on the upper left was my, uh, sort of started this whole project with me when we were in the same department in Missouri together. And uh, he has still been doing it. It's like 20, almost 30 years later and he's still working on that system. So he, he's by far the main source of information about this. John Lill was his postdoc and Rebecca Forkner was also his postdoc. And both of them are now at uh, George Washington University in Virginia, in D Washington DC that is. Um, and Steve Passo is at the Ohio USDA. He's one of the people who tried to figure out what all those caterpillars are. Um, and the Missouri Department of Conservation and the Forest Service funded all of this stuff, including the field guide. And uh, I put this slide up again at the end because uh, if you want a, um, a copy, a, a PDF copy of this field guide with all the color and photos and everything, you can get it for free. Um, but like most, uh, like many USDA uh, websites, it seems to have a lot of layers to it and it's kind of difficult to get by just searching. So what I would suggest is you, you Google this, um, this uh, name here to the right, the F Hust 2019-05. And then what happens when you get there is you'll get this little um, screen that pops up saying featured publication. And then you have a place where you can click and you can get it. I quite literally have found no other way to get it, even though I know it's on their website. But if you just Google it and get to that, that page, you're home free and you can get it for free. Um, they initially printed some hard copy versions of it, but uh, now the only way to get it is to get it as a, uh, uh, an online version or you can get a PDF of it that you can use at home. So anyway, thanks for uh, letting me show you some caterpillars this evening and uh, I'll be interested in any questions you have.